Chapter 31, It Was Just Business Mariano Chuy Martinez, boxer's old pinnacle partner at Folsom back in the mid-1980s, was on the outside running so much action that quite a few other brothers wanted him dead. Enriquez didn't feel that way. He liked Chuy, and for good reason. After Black Dan and Weddle Shy were convicted at the RICO trial and locked up in the federal system, it was Chuy he counted on as a reliable MA contact on the street. He was a mafioso who allowed my business interests to flourish. He knew Huck, my crew chief, and wouldn't hesitate to lend a helping hand anytime I had a turf dispute. Unlike some other carnales, Chewy never attempted to move in on my territories. He had a thriving operation of his own throughout the Los Angeles basin and understood there was enough business for us both. That's why we got along so well. Boxer and Chewy had been made within a month of each other at Folsom in 1985 lived on the same tier, walked the yard together, and bonded. As Mafioso said Enriquez, we were on our honeymoon phase. More than a decade later, both knew that their honeymoon with the mob had turned into a bad marriage. Chewy was a burly tough cholo with a shaved head and huge bushy mustache that spread across his face and drooped down at the edges in the style of Mexican revolutionaries Emilio Zapata or Pancho Villa. He was a fearless killer who had been shot so many times himself that he had bullet fragments lodged in his head, chest, and spine. On the other hand, he didn't do drugs, spoke fluent French, loved playing chess, and had more than a mild passion for Snickers candy bars. During Christmas time, he had a ritual of passing out presents to poor children in the Barrio Nuevo Estrada neighborhood where he grew up in East Los Angeles. Prior to his membership in La M, Boxer added, Chewy was a big PCP dealer who often went to Hollywood's famed Brown Derby restaurant and he hung out with a singing group called Tierra. Boxer said, Chewy had strong business acumen and knew how to make money. In his late 30s, Martinez owned a video store in a restaurant, had a share in a nightclub called Luminaries, and drove around in a late model Cadillac DeVille. It was all from drug profits and MA taxes collected from street gangs in many different parts of Los Angeles. There was little doubt with a dozen other mafia heavyweights locked up forever after their 1997 RICO convictions that Martinez had become a cash machine. He was raking in huge amounts of money according to Boxer and a number of mafia brothers in Pelican Bay State Prison thought Chewy was keeping too much of it for himself. Not sharing the wealth. Part of the problem, according to Boxer, was that Mafia heavyweight Topo Peters told Chewy he could direct MA activities on the streets. Unfortunately, he sent the same message to Victorio Murillo, the only MA member found not guilty in the RICO trial who was living in a town called Visalia in California's Central Valley. Topo was just trying to get some money from both of them, but he pitted Chewy against Victorio. On December 13, 1997, several Mexican Mafia members, including Victorio, met at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, arriving in luxury automobiles and limousines to discuss the future of Mariano Chuy Martinez. During the meeting, Charles Chacho Woody, a reputed multiple murderer, volunteered to put the hit on Chuy whenever the mob wanted it done. Unfortunately for him, there was an informant in the room wearing a wire and the FBI was elsewhere in the hotel taking it all down. That informant was John Tursak, aka Stranger. He wasn't even a Mexican. His family was from Czechoslovakia, but he grew up in the thick of gangbangers in Highland Park, Northeast LA. And at 13 years of age, he had joined the Rockwood Gang based in Echo Park. He had a relationship with cocaine since those early years and was involved in shootings. An arrest for robbery at 16 was a planned murder that was foiled by police. During years in prison for robbery and false imprisonment, he did approximately 10 stabbings, most at the direction of La M, killing inmate Gabriel Pato Rodriguez at Folsom in 1990. Boxer met him once in the law library at Pelican Bay. He looked weird and I thought he was an idiot, but he was made after he left prison. The 26-year-old Tursack was long-haired and scruffy-looking, more akin to a head-banging heavy metal devotee than the shaved-headed gang members of his age group. 
Out on parole in late 1996, the loud and talkative Tursack quickly violated his terms of release by hanging out with other gangsters and testing dirty for cocaine. He was headed back to prison, but the feds offered him an alternative. In April 1997, he became a $2,000 a month paid informant for the FBI. In the months that followed, Tursack continued to have chronic problems with nose candy and the feds paid $1,500 to send him to drug rehab. Also, during his time as a snitch for the government, the Czech Mexican Mafia thug, unknown to his FBI handlers, continued to wrangle up M extortion payments on the street. This presented a problem for Boxer. Tursack got out on the street and tried to tax my crews. He demanded $100 for every ounce of dope sold by Huck, Boxer's crew chief. I had Huck call Chewy, who then sent word to Terzak to stay away from my crews. And I wired instructions to Huck. If Terzak or his camaradas tried to collect taxes from any of our crews, tell them, if you try to take this, you are stealing directly from Boxer. And if Terzak insists on payment, kill him. All the while, Chewy Martinez refused to meet personally with Terzak, who felt snubbed by the prosperous mafia shot caller. So, expanding on his duplicitous dealings with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Tursak participated with others in several plots to kill Chewy. Six days after the Emmett powwow in Las Vegas, Chewy pulled his caddy into a Montebello taco stand at about 9.30 at night with his fiance Jessica Barreto, and a male companion. Gunshots ripped through his windshield, door jam, and radiator as Chewy pushed his girlfriend down on the seat and stepped on the gas to escape. Four bullets tore into the driver's side and fragments struck Chewy in the left side of his head and right hand. Bloody but alive, he drove to a nearby hospital and was treated for his wounds. Unbelievably, the untwo riding in the car were not hit. Boxer heard the news the next weekend during prison visits. I thought it was getting serious. These guys were going to move on me too, on my street operations. It boiled down to greed. Guys like Tursack and Woody wanted control. We had solid street crew operations and they didn't. It was a move by them to weaken our position and political standing in Lyme. Shortly after he got shot, Chewy Martinez set up a meeting with Tursack in a passenger lounge at Los Angeles International Airport. He knew each of them would have to pass through a metal detector to get in. The talk accomplished nothing. Boxer got a letter from Chewy. He was outraged that they tried to kill him, Boxer said. He thought it was a cowardly attack and he vowed to whack all those guys who plotted against him. Meanwhile, Tursack had audio taped for the FBI the explanation by the murderous Chacho Woody of his conversation in December with 40-year-old Roy Little Spider Galvedon from Cantaranas about his willingness to kill Chewy. According to Woody, he was an outsider who would do anything to get into the organization and I always opposed him. I knew he would only be an enemy and if he really cared about his wife, he would have killed me. The truth is, he didn't care about her and he had her hustling on the streets to support his drug habit while he was in prison. It's just business. In March 1998, Tursack got a letter from an MA member at Pelican Bay and he turned it over to his FBI handlers. It read, Chewy Martinez is no longer holding honor as a carnal. He has in the past to present violated the law of our ordinance, carnalismo, brotherhood. However, on behalf of all of us carnas, verdaderos, true brothers, here, Chewy must go. Boxer said everyone in the Bay was saying kill Chewy because they were jealous of his success. I did what I could to politic in his favor, but it did little to no good. The carnales smelled blood. In April, a frustrated Tursack, unable to get to Chewy, sent orders into LA County Jail to assault two of his associates instead. Mafia henchmen beat up Chewy's nephew in his cell, but he survived without serious injury. One of his crew members was stabbed and hurt badly, but managed to survive. On April 8th, after the attacks, the FBI monitored another telephone conversation in which a Mafia member advised Tursack to deal with Chewy and forget about the people around him. Later on that same day, Tursack called another carnal. 
I will set it up, referring to a hit on Chewie. The next day, still having doubts that Terzak would actually carry out the hit, an FBI agent personally contacted Chewie Martinez at his parole office and warned him that his life was in danger, giving no details. Chewie, forever the gangster, scoffed at the Fed's offer of protection. Chewie couldn't take protection, explained Boxer, because he could deal with it on his own. That kept him honorable in the eyes of the mob. He was a stand-up guy. Shortly afterward, there was a twist of events. A gangster, Terzak, had tried to enlist to do the hit. In turn, surreptitiously passed the information along to Chewie. A couple of days later, on April 4th, more than three weeks earlier, 52-year-old Victor Murillo had been shot and killed in a dirt parking lot near a Greyhound bus station in Goshen, a little farm town in the Central Valley, not far from his home, 160 miles northwest of Los Angeles. Murillo ran a lucrative cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin operation. Agents speculated that he was whacked for his refusal to share drug profits with younger mafiosi, or possibly because of false perception that he was secretly cooperating with law enforcement to win an acquittal a year earlier in the RICO trial. Boxer Enriquez had a more direct theory. Victorio was one of the brothers who met in Las Vegas and decided to kill Chewie. Chewie did the right thing and killed Victorio first. Chewie is the epitome of what a mafioso should be. He was smart and took action. With Murillo dead and Tursack locked up, Chewie Martinez pushed forward with his drug operation. According to federal records, Chewie had at the very least two dozen gangs paying him taxes, north, south, east, and west of the City of Angels. Also, his faction controlled all MA activities in LA County Jail. He still wanted Terzak dead too. Boxer said that he received a wheeler from Chewy in coded language that basically said, back me up on this murder and I'll continue to back you up on the streets. On November 17, 1998, federal agents received information that Max Mono Torvisco, Chewy's right hand man, said Terzak would be killed either in prison or when he got out. The next day, there was no waiting when it came time to wiping out a close associate of Tursacks, a big drug dealer named Richard Serrano, who was spotted hanging out at a Montebello auto body shop. After Chewie got the word, investigators said that he got on the phone and directed crew members to kill Serrano and all potential witnesses. According to later courtroom testimony, Chewie directed the carnage from a nearby location, communicating on a two-way radio with the hitman. Serrano was cornered in an office by two city terrorist gang members armed with 380 handguns and executed while on his knees. The body of Enrique Delgadillo was found next to his and Jose Martin Guterres was shot and killed while preparing a wall outside the shop. The others were shot and left for dead outside but survived. Boxer recalled Chewie had those guys whacked and it was the hottest topic of the week at Pelican Bay. Chewie in the weeks following the massacre made it clear to his mafia protege Mono Torvisco that they should go forward with plans to kill Stranger Tursac. This was a collective effort of our MF faction and Stissy Boxer to rid ourselves of opposition in the streets and in the prisons. Then on February 2nd, 1999, hundreds of law enforcement officers from the FBI, LA County Sheriff's Department, Los Angeles Police Department, and other agencies swept down on certain Los Angeles neighborhoods in more than a dozen outlying cities arresting Mexican Mafia members and their associates. A new federal indictment named 27 people for violating the RICO Act and spelled out Mafia goals to use murder and mayhem to control all drug trafficking in Southern California while using a vast network of Latino street gangs. The indictment alleged four murders including the Montebello Massacre, three attempted murders, and 13 conspiracies to commit murder, four conspiracies to assault or assaults with a deadly weapon, and multiple conspiracies to distribute drugs. During the arrest, cops found 37 weapons, including an AK-47 rifle. During the arrest, cops found 37 weapons, including an AK-47 assault rifle and a hand grenade. Back in the 1950s, we had organized crime dealing with La Costa Nostra 
in upstate New York, said FBI assistant director in charge, Timothy McGuff. Back in the 1950s, we had organized crime dealing with La Costa Nostra in upstate New York, said FBI assistant director in charge, Timothy McNally. It took better than 30 years of indictments of federal and state prosecutors across the country to put away really the hierarchy of most all the families. The Mexican Mafia is one of our primary organized crime groups on the West Coast, McNally continued. They've been around for a long time and we are in this for the long haul. There would be four separate trials over the next two years as the list of indicted co-conspirators grew to 45 defendants involved in mafia business. Boxer Enriquez was not named. Sergeant Richard Valdemar believed that Boxer had a smooth operation and stayed under the radar. Mariano Chuy Martinez, singled out as the top ranking leader for Laeme in Los Angeles, became the first death penalty defendant to be tried in LA federal court since 1950. The star witness in each trial was an articulate, fast-talking former student at Cal State University in Los Angeles, Max Mono Torvisco, Chewy's 24-year-old top lieutenant. Torvisco, who had also sent tax money to Boxer from time to time, made a deal with the government prosecutors after spending only a few weeks behind bars. A federal death penalty act had recently been expanded and he didn't want to tempt fate by going to trial himself and possibly ending up on death row. During his testimony, Mono admitted that he had ordered as many as 40 murders, killed three people on his own, and participated in numerous stabbings and shootings. He identified himself as one of the four Mexican Mafia members who ran street operations in the greater Los Angeles area, including his mentor, Mariano Chuy Martinez. He didn't hesitate to tell the jury, I was the one with the brains. Mono testified that Martinez referred to him as my son, as he brought him up through the ranks of Barrio Estrada Nuevo, v &E, and into the Mafia. Typical of mob duplicity, he also admitted that he had been planning to kill Chuy shortly before their RICO arrest. During cross-examination, he was asked if he had any qualms about murdering his mentor. His answer echoed a line from Francis Ford Coppola's movie, The Godfather. No, it was just business, nothing personal. Chuy Martinez, the only RICO defendant ultimately facing the death penalty, was tried alone. He was found guilty of racketeering, drug dealing, murder for ordering the Montebello Body Shop Massacre, and conspiring to murder nine other people, including mafioso turned informant John Stranger Tursak. In a separate trial, five gangsters charged in connection with the Montebello Body Shop Massacre, including two actual shooters, were acquitted. The jury foreman later said about key witness Max Torvisco, We found him to be out and out lying about the murders. As soon as we caught him lying, he was dead meat, and so was the prosecution's case. Rival Tursak pleaded guilty to various RICO offenses and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. This is a footnote that's at the bottom of the page. Rene Enriquez claimed that Mono was never a made member of the MA, despite his claims otherwise. According to Enriquez, Topo Peters told Chuy Martinez that Mono was voted in, but that was a bold-faced lie. Enriquez said that Mono was denied membership in votes at Pelican Bay and at the federal MA faction. Topo lied about it because Chewy and Mono were giving money to Sally Peters, Topo's wife, and Peters didn't want those funds to dry up by offending either one of them. <laughs> yeah, dirty mafia politics, just like dirty NF politics, boy. 43-year-old Roy Little Spider Galvedon, who had offered to whack Chewy to make his bones in the mafia, was convicted of racketeering and drug charges. He was sentenced to 21 years in prison. Charles Chacho Woody, also originally in on the plans to hit Chewy, pleaded guilty to murdering Victorio Murillo and was sentenced to 23 years in prison. On February 19, 2003, Max Mono Torvisco, whose testimony in six trials helped produce 50 convictions, was finally sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for racketeering. The public and the news media were barred from the heavily guarded courtroom during the proceeding. Mono fidgeted as he stood in front of U.S. District Judge Dickren Tervisian awaiting the decision. 
Brian A. Newman, Mono's defense attorney, had asked for a lesser sentence. He pleaded that his client is in extreme danger for the rest of his life. No one argued that assertion. During Chewie's trial, defense attorney Mark Overland tried to paint him as a peacemaker who tried to stop the gang banging and the killing of innocent people. It didn't quite work. Chewie was convicted on multiple counts. However, on March 29, 2001, the jury deadlocked 7 to 5 during the penalty phase of the trial on whether to give Mariano Chewie Martinez the death penalty. U.S. District Judge David O. Carter was forced to declare a mistrial and sentenced Chewie to life in prison plus 130 years. Chewie went off to a federal penitentiary forever, joining Black Dan, Barella, and Weto Shai Shyrock. Boxer Enriquez lost his last strong mafia ally on the street. It further deteriorated my political base. All my support on the streets was gone now. I found myself in turf battle after turf battle, arguing with one carna after another, and it was wearing me down. I was left in Pelican Bay drifting. The wolves were circling.